Welcome to Driving Innovation in Insurance, a series of virtual panel discussions focusing on the impact of digital transformation on the insurance value chain. I am Rodra Bhattacharya, and we are here today on the very first episode, The New Age Actuary. Our discussion today will revolve mostly around the evolving role of actuaries in the digital era and how technology like AI and ML have fundamentally redefined actuarial work. Joining me today are some esteemed thought leaders from the insurance industry, including Sunil Sharma, President at Institute of Actuaries of India, and President and Chief Actuary and CRO at Kotak Life Insurance, Gaurav Malhotra, Appointed Actuary at Bajaj Alliance General Insurance Company Limited, Michael Rabin, Customer Advisory Insurance Industry, SAS DACH, Mehul A. Shah, Appointed Actuary and Chief Risk Officer, Kotak General Insurance, Sovik Josh, Executive Vice President and Appointed Actuary at Tata AIA Life Insurance, and Dr. Andreas Bex, Head of Customer Advisory Insurance, SAS DACH. A very warm welcome to all of you today. Thank you for joining us. We will begin the session with a keynote address by Mr. Sharma on core competencies of actuaries well suited for data sciences and analytics. Next, there will be a keynote presentation by Mr. Rabin and Dr. Bex on actuarial transformation, the evolving role of actuaries for the innovation agenda of insurance. This will be followed by a panel discussion where our experts will share their thoughts on today's topic. Uh, we, do, we are open for questions at the end of the panel session, and we also have some polls as well. So, you know, just note those. Without further ado, let's get started. I would first like to invite Mr. Sharma to begin his. Thank you, Rodra, for your introduction. And uh, uh, I'll begin with dear panelists. Uh, we've got a very, very experienced uh, panel today. Uh, a very, very good evening uh, to all the experienced panelists that we have on this uh, panel as uh, Rodra introduced. Uh, dear all professionals who are attending the webinar, all actuaries uh, and non-actuaries uh, and, and, and you know, data scientists and analysts uh, who are experienced in, in this area, a very, very good evening. Well, first and the foremost, I would like to thank HT Digital for inviting me to deliver the keynote address and share my thoughts with you. The title of the webinar, as, as you would see, is the New Age Actually. It's, it's pretty interesting and, and it's very, very topical at the moment. Uh, and in fact, this prompted me to really ask myself if I'm a New Age Actually. Uh, well, the idea is, is really to deliberate uh, the evolving role of an Actually uh, in the emerging era of uh, artificial intelligence and, and the machine learning that's, that's evolving. Uh, and, uh, you know, if, if some of the Actuaries are listening, I think they know me always, I always mention that I believe in the statement which says an actuary is not an actuary if he or she is only an actuary. Uh, I would like to spend a couple of minutes on the evolu evolution of the actual profession. If you look at historically, actuary, actuaries have adopted uh, to new techniques and the technologies uh, as and when they emerge historically. If you look at, well, I'll just go back in 17th century when actuaries developed deterministic models for managing the life insurance business. Uh, and then they actually were involved in conducting the pricing and the valuations using uh, the, the typical commutation function tables, uh, and there were no computers at that time. And uh, if you look at, uh, you know, in 20th century, actually started getting involved in the probabilistic methods in general insurance business. And later, uh, you know, if you, if you look at the history, when the computers were invented, it was perceived as a threat to the actual profession. And I was like, well, you know, what, what will be the future of uh, actuaries who do a lot of works using calculators and, and other calculations if the, if the computer can replace their job. Uh, but I think if I were to look at the, the computers really came as blessing to the actual profession. Uh, you know, it gives uh, two things. One, actually, uh, you know, the faster computation led to uh, transition from the commutation functions, basis calculations to cash flow methods or projections. Also, a significant shift, uh, which was moving from deterministic calculations uh, to really stochastic outcome to look at 
range of scenarios, a distribution of the outcome, and see what would happen in, in, in various scenarios, uh, or, or perhaps, you know, 2,000, 3,000 scenarios following certain distributions. Uh, and, you know, the calculations which used to take weeks, uh, it, it, it could be done in hours. So I would say, I think, uh, actuaries, uh, uh, you know, shifted to the computers and, and really, it really worked as a blessing uh, for, for their work. Uh, and, uh, you know, if I, if I talk about myself, I think uh, I started my career 30 years back uh, with the only life insurance company in India at that time. Uh, and, you know, actually of my age grew learning calculations using the commutation functions, actual notations, the actual tables, and, and the computer got introduced at a very, very late stage. Uh, you know, we all developed, uh, and some of my colleagues would remember, we developed the programs in DOS-based Fox Pro to do the actual computations. Uh, traditionally, uh, if you look at it, actually is working on the product development, pricing, valuations, and risk management of, uh, you know, this life, health, general, uh, and, and pension liabilities. Uh, while actually, if you look at, they have been uh, analyzing a large amount of data of the policyholders and determining their best estimate for the futures. Uh, now, what has happened is uh, in the new world, if you look at the past trend, may not necessarily continue to be indicative of future. And, and the policyholders' is, is behavior is changing much faster now as compared to what used to happen in, in, in past. And there's so much of information is available to everybody. And then which actually just, uh, you know, kind of change the policyholders' behavior uh, quickly. And uh, it is a change of, uh, the change in the behavior of the policyholders which drives the the emerging experience, uh, uh, you know, with regards to the, the distributions, distributors' behavior or the customers' behavior. And uh, a huge amount of data is available now. Uh, and it's extremely crucial uh, to really, uh, you know, use this data, not to ignore any field in the data and design the tools using the latest technology, uh, which will really help uh, the faster decision making for, for the insurers or perhaps, you know, whatever business you are in, in any of the financial services. And, and let me just talk, so how could actuaries really, uh, you know, play a role there? Well, if you look at actuaries do have core competencies in the financial services business. Uh, they've been dealing with the large data uh, and then deriving conclusions from that. And actuaries are very well placed uh, for data, side, data analytics and, and predictive modeling. Uh, and, and one critical thing that we keep in mind is, uh, you know, while this uh, artificial intelligence or machine learning can give an output, it's the actuary's core competencies uh, is actually critical to review the review and interpret the outcome uh, for the better decision making. Uh, and if you look at it, I think uh, globally, the actual professions uh, realize the importance of including some of the applications uh, of uh, AI uh, as, as a part of curriculum and uh, you know, some of the practical modeling examinations. We also in the Institute of Actuaries of India have already introduced uh, our language and, and, and you know, one of the modeling examinations in the education curriculum 2019 in line with the, the, the global curriculum. But this will really help uh, actuaries to make sure that they can look at the programming and build tools to really conduct the analysis in line with the emerging trend. Uh, so as we move forward, we need to really add more detail than, uh, you know, while we introduce this in our curriculum, I think we need to uh, have much more detail than higher level of courses uh, in, in R and Python for our actual students uh, to really uh, help them enable, to enable them to really, uh, you know, utilize or, or do the programming uh, uh, to, uh, to do the data analytics and, and uh, draw the conclusion from, from, from that. Uh, and, you know, if you look at uh, some of the institutes globally have already started making progress in that. If we were in mean, some of the discussion I had with Society of Actuaries US, they already started predictive, mod predictive modeling as uh, in, in their course curriculum. So, so I think, uh, you know, new age actually need to equip themselves with the latest tools and, and, and the technology uh, that, that is there, uh, which is being offered by the technology. I would really refer to uh, recently, uh, some of you may have attended the, the Actuaries Day celebrations and the chief guest there, Sri, Dr. Sri uh, Sanjeev Sanyal, uh, in his address mentioned, you know, what the difference between risk and uncertainty. Uh, and it was a very interesting perspective that he brought uh, during his uh, address. 
this is the while the past data can be used for managing the risk uh, all professionals and he was also talking about his own profession uh, economics uh, economist and the actual profession and it said that all professions uh, including our actual profession need to really update itself with the latest technology which could really better handle emerging uncertainties and that's what he actually differentiated between risk and the uncertainties and he gave an example of you know one of the uncertainties which is uh, uh, came as this covid 19 uncertainties you know now none of the past models that we had of the past experience could really help us uh, projecting you know the futures uh, and, and the impact of covid 19 and that's when uh, you know some of the emerging experience and 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 feed feedback of the emerging experience to the model uh, could really help in terms of faster uh, uh, faster uh, feedback and uh, training the tool and, and getting the output. I think uh, uh, I would say that uh, it, it offers a huge opportunity for the actuaries in various sectors. Uh, and it gives some examples. Uh, you know, say for example, underwriting is based on the, you know, can be based on the policyholders' attributes. Uh, you could really do a lot of uh, uh, process improvement uh, by, instantly, say for example, policy issuance based on the attribute of the policyholders. Uh, and uh, using uh, uh, you know the, the the past experience, the past policyholders' behavior, feeding that back into the model, and see what sort of attributes uh, uh, you know give the better experience, and uh, you know do more fraud analytics and help uh, faster issuance of the policy. You could actually offer pre-approved coverages to the existing customers with minimal or no underwriting. You can do instant claim settlements of the customers with certain attributes. Uh, based on your, uh, you know, uh, learning, machine learning in the past experience uh, of the customers and feeding that back and getting what attributes, uh, you know, are, 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 are there to really help in terms of, uh, you know, filtering out the, 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 the fraud, fraudulent claims versus the claims uh, which can immediately be settled. And I think, uh, you know, the companies, obviously, most of the companies have started uh, making data lakes, create large database for their customers, distributor, distributors, and employees, and how those database, the behaviors, all of these are interrelated. And this behaviors are an impact on the policyholders' uh, uh, you know, outcome, say, for example, persistency or uh, claims experience, uh, et cetera, and really optimize uh, you know, those behaviors uh, by, by using the, the learnings uh, from the emerging experience. And, and actually find out when and where the intervention is required. Uh, this will really, uh, you know, you could, you could really maximize, use uh, AI or ML to really en enhance or maximize your persistency uh, by tracking the propensity and setting up certain thresholds uh, and continuously enriching the data with other sources uh, based on the, the emerging experience. Uh, well, I can go on and uh, go on and go on and on in terms of potential and the opportunities. Uh, I think while the profession is equipping the uh, equipping the budding actuaries uh, with uh, you know all these uh, new uh, emerging uh, tools like R we already introduced in the course, uh, we need to continue to embrace the technology and upgrade the skill sets. Uh, and that's all actuaries do have that role to play for their teams and and, and themselves. So if I were to look at summarize uh, a new age actuary. I think if you the, the the a new age actually should have the core business skills which they do, uh, and, and see what matters for the business and the customers. The new age actually has domain knowledge, including mathematics and the statistics. The new age actually has expert level technical actual skills, uh, you know, which really helps to take the take the decisions and help management to to really run the organization. A new age actually has a, a an excellent communication skills because you know just the technical skill does not help. Uh, a, a new age actually will have an excellent communication skills to explain the outcome of the analysis to the management. And the last but not the least, I think uh, you know building the program or writing the codes in R or Python, which are commonly used in AI and ML these days, can really help uh, you know actuaries to really become uh, specialized uh, analyst. Uh, uh, you know, and, and, and utilize these tools to, for the faster uh, business decisions, help the business to grow optimally and uh, in the best interest of the policyholders and the shareholders. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Sharma. I mean, this was uh, very interesting. Uh, 
extremely interesting talk and also very timely uh, i mean you mentioned it uh, given the current situation uh, with covid and pandemic i think it's important that we embrace a lot of uh, new technologies and keep ourselves updated because the world is extremely dynamic today and uh, none of us can really predict it as as well so uh, thanks a lot uh, a lot of food for thought for us uh, moving forward i would like to invite uh, dr bex and uh, mr raven uh, to begin their uh, keynote uh, presentation Thanks, Michael, for sharing the screen. Um, as we heard, digitalization, big data, AI, they're really changing the role of not only the insurance, but therefore also, of course, the role of the actuaries. And of course, you can read a lot of reports out there, like uh, McKinsey's Insurance 2030 or Deloitte's Exponential Actuary or the Big Data and Insurance Report, a very interesting reading by the Geneva Association, which is the leading think tank of insurance CEOs. And they depict different aspects of future actual profession, just uh, like we have just seen and heard uh, from Mr. Sharma. I think a good way to summarize all these perspectives is really to look at the main needs and the topics of insurance CEOs on their digital transformation agenda. And there, it all comes down to creating the customer experience of future insurance. So based on what modern consumers are expecting in terms of flexibility, agility, access to products and services, and of course, also from the communication with the insurance. So consider that insurance customers are not thinking in typical organizational silos as most organizations do. So what are cons customers and consumers expecting in the digital area? Of course, they are expecting custom tailored and very individual flexible products. So in the home turf of the actuaries in products and pricing, Actuaries need to design more dynamic usage-based products and they can use AI or machine learning methods to assess the risk profiles in a better way. So the risk selection will get better. There's also, of course, a chance for insurers to ensure what has been uninsurable before. So we can have a much more precise risk selection and that, that gives us the chance. We also see that regulatory authorities they review AI and machine learning using explainable AI and governance methods so that we can make all the procedures and the whole process transparent. So that's happening in the product and pricing area. Customers also want a consistent experience whenever they communicate with the insurer or the insurer offers a product via different channels or services to them. Then if you look at claims management, this of course is where the promise becomes truth and here, Insurers strive for straight through processing for rapid responses to claims. And this, of course, of course, takes many perspectives into account. So the model needs to predict the severity of the damage, the fraud scoring, the likelihood of maybe legal challenges or the customer value to determine exactly what would be the next best action. And all these touch points, they are linked from a, a customer perspective. So the interaction of the decision cannot be restricted to a certain silo because customers don't know the silos. If my claim was rejected, the CMO better starts a customer loyalty measure rather than giving an upsell offer. Or if an insurer offers a flexible product with optional tariff components, hey, this is the basis for more customer touch points along the life cycle. And of course, marketing needs to consider that. In the European market, we also observe a very strong strategic evolution some may say revolution from pure risk protection towards more of predicting and preventing risk. So large insurers are on their way of seeing themselves more as a lifetime partner than um, the one who pays for damages. So the field of smart insurance, that is an emerging field that brings big data, wearables and IoT to health and life science as well. So all the flexibility, all the agility, all the interaction of a digital PNC insurer, as we see it already today, will affect live actuaries as well. So the risks insurance cover, the ways they underwrite, sell, distribute, manage claims, they are changing. And basically, it all comes down to automating the decision process across different business functions. So what's the right tariff structure? How severe is the damage? How do I best cope with a certain customer? And all these requirements are similar. They are data-driven. They make use of new methods, AI, machine learning. They, you need to be able to decide in real time while you have a conversation with the customer. You need to operationalize the decision process. That's one of the 
four aspects that Mr. Sharma said is very important for the actual of the future. You need to be able to program in the end also the, the interaction to operationalize it. So what does that mean for the role of the actual profile? Um, let's, let, let's have a look at the actuary home turf, at the actuary departments and EMEA, especially in PNC, where we see a large evolution of the future role. And Michael will guide you through what we are seeing there. Michael. Yes. Hello. Can you hear me? Perfect. Okay. Um, whenever I talk to actuaries across EMEA, um, they are very consistent in the in the many anchor points that they see for actual modernization in order to be future-proof. And I would like to share some of them with you today. So um, the most time-consuming task is, of course, getting the data and getting it ready. As this mostly includes requests to IT and lots of fine-tuning and communication across departments, this step often gets in the way of using data in a more innovative way. So getting the actuary more in the driver's seat with self-service and visual data exploration is a huge productivity booster. Today, technical pricing is mostly a repetition of last year's work with fresh data and some statistical tweaks. Here's a great chance to bring real innovation to the rate making. Be more creative in finding potential risk predictors in more and different data. Challenge traditional modeling techniques with self-learning and highly non-linear methods and use the breadth of latest and greatest algorithms from the open source community. And when it comes to commercial pricing, actuaries seek to exploit potentials in the existing portfolio by using high performance optimization engines instead of simply sketching Excel scenarios as we often find it today. And they need to manage and govern the ever increasing amount of models they create in a professional manner, for sure. And one of the most exciting aspects in my personal view is extending the role of actuaries in the rating process. Dynamic pricing means that you consider not only the given tariff logic, but competitor price, underwriting rules, propensity models, optimum discount models, or price elasticity and the like. Technically, this requires that the actuary can deploy tariffs faster with lower IT involvement. And we use classical actuarial skills in model building in the underwriting process. So underwriters and actuaries will collaborate more intensively. And all in all, such an innovation program needs to be based on an analytical, on an analytical ecosystem that provides a seamless and robust process experience to actuaries, whilst integrating good working third party tools wherever reasonable. Automation, governance, and transparency are key. So let's look at the process. Dynamic and flexible rate making is a continuous cycle or loop. It's not from one end to the other, and then it's finished. Work and responsibility do not end when a tariff is handed over to production. There's a constant need to control, adapt, and exchange productive models in order to ensure the creation of value in production in the long term. So I would like to briefly share more insights with you for two important aspects of this cycle. How can actuaries set up their actual department in a more modern and business-oriented way? First, pre-modeling and modeling. In other words, a field in which actuaries create value through exploration, innovation, and the best possible modeling. They are already doing so to a certain extent, but as we have seen, there's still much more potential. Second, if you now look to the right side of the process, for example, towards value creation and deployment, then decision design for dynamic pricing is a newer topic to most of the actuaries. Let's have a closer look on how, actively, how to actively drive innovation and improve modeling. How can we help actuaries to find better risk predictors and make use of new data? 
First, let's talk about exploration. As our eyes are the broadband line to our brain, visual methods for data exploration have proven to be more productive and creative in many applications. Also in rate making, we observe that actuaries take a significant advantage from visual data analytics in order to recognize relationships in known and unknown data quickly and intuitively. Sandboxing for machine learning turns out to be a significant aid to help actuaries familiarize themselves with new methods and check their value potential. To boost productivity, agile methods are key value drivers. This also means that actuaries need way to perform fast prototyping by just clicking models together in order to see if a detailed modeling is worth it. Finally, using easy to use machine learning, actuaries can easily challenge their productive GLM models with machine learning models, compare them and derive insights for further improvement on the productive model, for example, in the selection of variables. We've also seen that underwriters and actuaries need to work closer together for dynamic pricing. So how can actuaries actively manage product sales while taking into account customer behavior and can competitor prices? Dynamic pricing has to become the talk of the town in the insurance industry. Dynamic pricing requires actuarial skills because models get more important also in the underwriting process. This means that you consider not only the given tariff logic, but competitor pricing, underwriting rules, propensity models, optimum discount models, and the like. Thus, actuaries need to become more independent from old legacy systems and their drawbacks and need an environment where they can collaborate with underwriters. By extending the actuary's workbench and changing deployment methods, handing a rate book over to the IT for recoding is not necessary anymore. By use, uh, uh, the business users now owns this process and becomes responsible to create decision flows for dynamic pricing. This is done visually by combining classic tariff logic with rules, custom code, and additional analytical models to offer customer-specific prices at the point of sale that match the corporate and underwriting strategy of your company. Using this new way of deployment, IT efforts and costs are reduced significantly. And actuaries can deploy new tariffs and tariff changes with a much faster time to market. By the way, the role of an actuary, responsibilities, and working with other departments, for example, underwriters or marketing, differs from region to region. But look at it as a possibility of collaboration where assets can be contributed by different parties and put together in a decision tool. As we have seen in practice, overall actuaries can do more and create more value in less time. And because we are looking at it from the perspective of a smart decisioning ecosystem, actuaries in addition enjoy also a lot of platform benefits like process efficiency gains, customers of us measured up to 50%. Or actuaries are happy to now focus more on value-adding tasks like innovation, model improvement, and so on. And having a high frequent and robust process instead of a scattered one that also takes into account the need for automation, governance, and transparency. Finally, to take away any fear of big buzzwords like dynamic pricing, I brought you a customer example to show you that some insurance companies have already put this into practice. In Spain, for example, in times of low interests and in a market where insurers find hard for every customer, Casa Seguros is benefiting from having a modern actuarial platform, like I mentioned. In addition to a better retention rate and higher profits from the existing portfolio, thanks to optimization, market trends and competitor prices are analyzed for new business and allow them to make improved underwriting decisions in real time. And now, Andreas, over to you. Thank you, Michael. 
So we've seen that advanced analytics and big data fundamentally are changing the actuarial world. And machine learning is really coming to the actuaries. Machine learning is different from traditional methods because it's data-driven, it's often difficult to interpret, but it complements classical actuarial methods. And Michael has shown how underwriters and actuaries move closer together and realize real-time quoting processes. So the deployment, not only of tariffs, but a lot of more models for real-time decisions really becomes part of the actuary work. So this is not only the case for product and pricing, it's becoming more common for actuaries to work in non-traditional roles. Uh, for example, in some firms, we see that they are modeling sales and distribution processes to identify characteristics of effective agents, or they innovate using big data uh, produced by telematics devices for car insurance, for example, or they contribute to the claims process. So to quote Mr. Sharma, an actuary is only an actuary if he or she is not just an actuary. And while all this holds, especially for PNC insurers today, I'm sure that life insurance will quickly follow. So we have a change of the role, we have new methods, we have openness, we have agility, and all this calls for new and orchestrated processes and tools. It's not just the role, it's also the process, the tooling. We need to talk about governance, repeatability, reliability of processes and transparency, of course. So, but the most important point I think is that there are new collaborative ways of working, which is also um, why the communication aspect that Mr. Sharma has shown is very important. So actuaries, underwriters, marketing guys, claims, they work together and this requires a common ground, not only the communication, but also bringing together people with different skills. We need to support creative processes for gaining insights. And of course, also highly reliable processes for production. And of course, a whole bunch of technology, whether it's SAS, whether it's Python, whether it's cloud technology. So a whole bunch of things come together here and therefore actuarial information really needs a consistent smart decisioning ecosystem. And I'm happy to talk about this also in the panel. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. For that uh, wonderful uh, presentation, I think uh, uh, I'm sure our audience has uh, gathered lots of uh, interesting insights from this presentation. Uh, if you need to uh, know more uh, and get in touch uh, with uh, either Dr. Bex or Mr. Rabin, you can book a one-on-one -on -one meeting uh, or download uh, the resources available on the event page. Uh, the link to the page uh, is uh, my colleague is just sharing it in the chat box uh, so that we can help you can get, a, get in touch with us there. So it is time uh, now for us to move on to the panel discussion. Uh, I would urge uh, everyone in the audience to uh, drop in their uh, questions at the comment section. I saw that we already have uh, two, three questions, uh, which are very interesting. We will take them at the end of the uh, panel discussion. Uh, before we start, though, uh, there is a quick poll uh, for our participants. I think uh, we have added a few polls, as I mentioned uh, before, uh, to make this uh, more fun for all of us. Uh, so I will just be sharing the first poll. We have about, uh, we'll have it on uh, about for about 10 to 15 seconds. Uh, Please uh, choose any of the answers, any, of, any one answer. Uh, this is our first poll. I'm still getting answers, so I've uh, I haven't removed it yet. Uh, okay, so that's about thirty seconds. I'm ending the poll. Sharing the results as well. I think uh, maybe we can uh, start on this note. Very interesting. So. Um, 79% of uh, our uh, participants today say yes to, uh, do you believe an integrated and collaborative uh, platform for actuaries and underwriters to manage risks is a key component of our digital transformation? Clearly there's a, a strong belief uh, in the community out there. 21% are there in the maybe, but I think, uh, I think they can be uh, converted as well. Okay. 
yeah so it is now time for us uh, to move to the uh, panel discussion uh, i've already introduced my panelists uh, i will do so once more so we have uh, mr uh, sunil sharma uh, who is the president of uh, the institute of actuaries of india and president and chief actuary and cro at kotak life insurance uh, we have gaurav malhotra uh, appointed actuary at uh, bajaj alliance general insurance company uh, michael rabin uh, michael rabin and uh, uh, dr bex both just made a presentation but dr bex will be joining us for the panel discussion uh, he is the head of uh, customer advisory insurance sas uh, germany uh, we also have uh, mr mehul shah appointed actuary and chief risk officer kotak general insurance and finally uh, mr uh, sovik josh uh, executive vice president and appointed actuary at tata aia life insurance welcome uh, to the panel discussion my first question uh, is for uh, is for uh, gaurav so what does uh, digital transformation mean for actuaries i mean uh, we've had two very uh, one one keynote and uh, a very interesting presentation so what does digital transformation mean for actuaries what has changed for you uh, and what are your expectations of uh, the near and maybe the mid term uh, future thanks rudra good evening everybody um, as you as uh, sunil said uh, actuaries have always been involved with data and they continue to uh, do so however if we look at the volume of data that has changed uh, that has grown exponentially so and the way data is captured uh, so earlier it is all nicely formatted in nice uh, fields we get the data which has now completely changed now we are talking about looking at unstructured data we are looking at uh, big data we are talking of uh, analyzing images uh, we are talking about uh, analyzing uh, even audio going forward the voice analytics so all this uh, uh would definitely change the tools and techniques uh, that actuaries have uh, used in the past so so the, so the, so they need to adapt uh, to this and um it's not that uh, these things are uh, far fetched a uh, lot of this uh, has already started uh, big data from telematics wearables uh, those things are uh, flowing in the customer uh, information from social media um the images uh, from accidents to uh, analyze claims better so all of these things are already flowing in and uh, um the actuaries have already uh, using these uh, data and uh, advanced techniques uh, to make best use of it fantastic thanks uh, thanks mr malhotra uh, mr sharma do you see uh, actuaries uh, becoming specialized uh, data scientists and playing an active role in uh, digital transformation of the business model of insurance uh, how do we convince uh, regulators to open up to experiments with these new tools uh, mr sharma you're on mute i'll just um thanks for the that's very interesting question that you that you raised uh, well actually if if you look at it uh, as i mentioned in my opening remarks uh, actually is uh, i have the are the domain experts in insurance traditionally in india uh you know they've got the whole the business knowledge and the domain experience and uh, you know they understand the big picture of of, of the business uh, and you know how the various parameters uh, there are large number of parameters small small things uh, which actually really have a large impact on the business they do understand the intricacies and the interdependence and the correlation of those with the with the business outcome you know in terms of how what would be the sensitivities of those decisions on the business outcome they are experts in the mathematics and the statistics uh, and already work with a large quantity of data and and and, and are used to the complex models i think if you talk about the models uh, the complexity of the models i think actuaries do deal with a lot of lot of complex models already and they do play a very critical role in terms of uh, you know uh, you know all the stakeholders uh, who drive the digitization and the transformation in the business so uh, i think the capabilities already exist in terms of dealing with the large data uh, the the business knowledge already exist uh, and uh, you know as i mentioned the key metrics and you know how do they impact uh, various outcomes of the business do already exist uh, the only thing that i actually uh, perhaps feel the need of is uh, is is really uh, you know updating uh, the knowledge on the technology uh, I, i think what's happening is uh, you know a lot of new uh, uh, technology innovations are happening 
and i think uh, we just need to catch up on on some of those things as i mentioned uh, uh, we have already uh, you know kind of introduced the language and the ma- the, the practical modeling uh, and and our language uh, in in our curriculum which is a good beginning uh, but i think uh, you know we need to start uh, really motivating our teams and uh, uh, you know the, the middle management middle actual team in terms of updating their skills with regard to the new technology uh, and, uh, and 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 you know uh, kind of utilize those new technology for the business decisions uh, if you were to ask me i think data scientist uh, you know uh, sometimes i i get into you know, a lot of discussion that we do uh, you know with our colleagues and also in the institute is to you know what is what does data scientist do versus let's say data analytics or an actually do uh, i think if you look at a lot of data scientists get involved in a lot of coding and programming uh, i would really see maybe the actuaries at the moment may not necessarily get into that uh, you know designing the program or doing the coding etc but i think uh, if you look at over a period at the moment they also do a lot of uh, programming in the sense in terms of uh, the the modeling and you know future projections etc Uh, but they may not do the coding from the scratch uh, they would uh, you know mostly uh, you know adapt or or perhaps modify the program to meet their needs uh, and, and 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 really uh, their expertise lies in terms of uh, the core competencies in terms of large data in terms of interpretation in terms of getting the output and how could you really utilize that for the business benefits which will continue to be the case uh, and, and 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 i think that's what going to happen i would expect that the new generation you know of, of more budding actuaries uh, you know would probably over a period will acquire much more uh, skills uh, as we have introduced you know our uh, and and also they'll get a more access to the python uh, would get into more specialized uh, uh, i would uh, i would say uh, you know data scientist uh, in in that area uh but but really as i said i think uh, it would be more of uh, you know core business uh, interpretation uh, and uh, uh, you know how do you really use the outcome for the for the for the business and given right. the communication skills and you'll be able to really uh, explain that to the management properly in terms of the implementation of those decisions thank you right sir so thanks um, so uh, my next question is for uh, mr shah uh, and this is really Uh, so so mr malhotra mentioned uh, touched upon this aspect so you know digital is transforming the way we are, we are used to living and uh, this is uh, leading to newer risks you know i mean so drones changing weather autonomous vehicles uh, cyber thefts id thefts uh, what are how are actual teams gathering this experience and pricing uh, these new age risks uh, so you are you're on mute yeah Yeah, can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, thanks, Madhuraj. Uh, uh, your question actually is is pretty vast, uh, especially for the way we really look at it. Uh, you are you are talking in terms of drones, uh, uh, cyber risk, autonomous vehicle, and so on and so forth. Each of this will actually require a lot more discussions. Uh, so I'll stick to what what is my favorite is basically on the autonomous vehicle. Uh, so autonomous vehicle definitely is is a Doesn't transformative uh, a transformative uh, change that we are really seeing it. uh uh in terms of risk definitely uh i will not really focus so much on risk but actually it uh, would be more more uh, precisely a question in terms of the way the data will really look like uh so definitely with autonomous vehicle coming on the on the scene uh, we are seeing a tsunami of uh, data uh, be it volume velocity variety of data that's that's going to be really really exponentially big uh and and the, and the pricing parameters may also change uh, from person uh, pricing to the vehicle specific pricing or maybe even the manufacturer pricing specific pricing may really really uh, emerge so so definitely uh, this is this is one one area where a lot of work is actually happening uh, uh, in, in fact i i do recall uh, 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 elon musk really talking about uh, that he needs a smart actuary Uh, who can really work on data science, and that's that's really the the sign of things to really come and uh, the way uh, the actuaries will get involved in this whole emerging space of AI, ML, and the autonomous vehicles. So that's that's definitely going to be very very interesting space, and uh, data data is definitely going to be far far more interesting, and volumes will keep on changing at very very fast pace. Yeah. 
So, uh, I mean, the key question is about uh, pricing new age risks uh, using all of this data. And I mean, uh, you know, of course, I mentioned a lot of different things, but of course, uh, autonomous vehicles and telematics that you sort of get from that is, yeah. is, is a significant large area. And this is growing sort of really fast. Uh, you know, stage yeah. uh, four or five automation uh, for uh, vehicles is, is, is not very far away. Uh, so, so how, I mean, uh, are we, uh, uh, is there other parts in the world where this is already being sort of used? Uh, what is really the way forward? Uh, we can get a little creative here just to make yeah. it a little exciting. Yes. Yeah. So, so, uh, it depends upon the extent of auto autonomous vehicle we are really talking about because over here, you're actually talking about the entire, uh, continuum of, uh, autonomous vehicle, starting from basic safety features. Uh, being, be, being, or safety sensors, not necessarily features. Features have been there in for a much, much longer time, but safety sensors being uh, inbuilt into the vehicle and going to the full self-driving vehicle. So this whole continuum of uh, space we are looking at it. Some of the pieces are already getting priced in uh, at, the, at, the, at the at the what actually it's it's for a want of a word I'm saying rudimentary level, uh, so, uh, which is which is basically the, the safety sensor one. Uh, on, on the entire uh, self-driving vehicle, definitely there is a lot more work happening, a uh, lot more uh, visualization uh, uh, analysis happening on that, not, not exactly visualization, but uh, in terms of understanding the, the visuals. Uh, so there's a lot more work happening on that space uh, from, a, from a pricing perspective is still far off because it's still not on the road. But over here, definitely a lot of work is already happening. Uh, so yeah, so that's, that's a nice way of uh, looking at it. Thanks, Mr. Shah. Uh, Mr. Josh, uh, so over to you. So what are the top three challenges you face as an uh, actuary today? And what is your expectation from uh, new age technologies like, like digital uh, AI, ML, uh, etc.? Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. So I think uh, if we have to talk about the challenges, let's understand uh, what are the business problems that we are trying to solve. Because uh, once I know the business problems, then I know where is the challenge coming. So if I look at the two I'd say two use cases of business challenges that uh, actuaries and particularly working in the life insurance uh, industry, uh, we will be posed uh, with. One is around uh, how do I assess risk? How do I price a risk? Today, uh, if you look at the traditional actuary, the traditional actuary <coughs> model requires you to sort of price a standard risk, which is a very standard way to do things. And then you fill up a full, uh, a long proposal for application form which the underwriter looks into it to see if it's still under the standard level. The future is not here. Future is going to change where can we use other predictors or associated data like uh, credit scores uh, or there are applications and credit scores that are being used to predict, used as a good proxy for mortality. Can they be used to sort of customize offering to customers? Or for example, uh, even in, in platforms like e-commerce platforms where by looking at the past history of the customer behavior, type of purchases, amount of purchases, or the wallet share spent, can I sort of predict that what kind of uh, income profile that customer belongs to and accordingly price the risk? Mm -hmm. So if I say the challenge for the actuary today uh, is how do I price this risk, which means that it requires you to look at and analyze, analyze the volume of data that's sitting beside it. Some of them will be unstructured, some of them structured, but may not have been used in traditional actual pricing. Mm -hmm. So having a tool, having a way to analyze the data and then finding a way to rate those uh, data in, in your uh, and, and use it for your rating factors in pricing is one of the challenges that, uh, that uh, tomorrow's actually has to solve. The other use case of a uh, challenge is that how do you optimize uh, the company's profit? So the element and something that uh, um, our co-panelist uh, brought it out in terms of the uh, price optimization techniques that are currently being used. Now, it has not been become popular, but then there are use cases that are used in some parts of the world where typically you can actually uh, look at the customer search history or basically what the your, your customer search traffic is coming and accordingly uh, 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 change your price on offer so that you can drive and also offer instant discount to get more customers in and then optimize your portfolio and your profitability. So this techniques, which requires again AI and ML coming in at the back end to help the actuaries to price it because this requires you instant pricing uh, capabilities and also the know-how how to do that pricing. So I think from a challenge point of view, these are all the things that uh, I think that tomorrow's actually and today they're facing, but in tomorrow's actually that these are going to be the core skills that they will be tested. and 
we'll see very good use in the industry and and see how they can actually um, advance the profession in this way as well because they they will be in demand those skill sets will be in demand uh mr josh uh, this is something uh, what you said is very interesting i mean using indirect data to sort of uh, uh, price uh, price insurance you know your your search patterns your social media usage or your uh, you know uh, e-commerce uh, basket for example right uh, where does the regulator uh, stand on this uh, discussion uh, because I, i find it very creative it's, it it sounds very exciting i'm sure there are experiments uh, happening in a, in a sort of a limited sort of a, uh, space already but but how do, how is it from all that perspective i would say that while uh, the popular perception is that regulator may not allow a thing i think regulators are there i think there are two considerations that they took uh, they normally ask you or me as an actually when i go to the regulator and say that i want to solve this problem this is what i thought of they ask you okay is the customer data is going not going to be compromised i'm doing things with this consent and does it work what is your uh, logic or, or and does this logic work these are the only thing that you need to solve and once you have explained them i have find regulators uh, uh, even indian regulators are very very open to uh, to try to make you try it out uh, things like the sandbox principle which the regulator has introduced actually are meant to sort of address few things earlier it used to happen in sort of like ad hoc way now those sandbox uh, ideas that are coming in is actually meant to sort of try it out and see it works so i would say i think it's a very wrong notion the regulator is very traditional no they are very very open to this kind of ideas provided you go with a credible plan and as well as uh, that you you sort of show them that how customer uh, protection is at the heart of the um, of your proposal very interesting um, uh, dr bex uh, that brings me to you i mean I, so i understand insurers uh, were among uh, the first customers for saas uh, back in 1976 right i mean saas has been working on uh large uh, data set solutions for a, for a while so how is uh, saas gearing to bring uh, ai ml and uh, digital closer to the actuarial fraternity yeah indeed many um, or most actuaries in, in most insurers across the world use saas and up to now it was mainly um for for data preparation or actuarial statistics and the recent years the past few years have been a transformation towards these these new techniques and as we heard also Uh, from from um, uh, Mr. Shah um, and, and um, Mr. Jash, uh, so the the methods change. The regulators look at that. So transparency, governance, they play important role because the the philosophies of the classical tools of actuaries and machine learning are different, completely different. So while one is hypothesis driven and very transparent, the other is data driven and often difficult to interpret. And due to these different philosophies. actuarials seek guidance and professional confidence when they use these methods and processes so this is how saas approaches it we are helping actuaries in different dimensions to name just a few we have an education program helping actuaries to make use of big data and machine learning to do the transformation from the classical methods to what's now machine learning um we incorporate in our tooling visual guidance quick prototyping capabilities diagnostic tools for interpretability to make machine learning easier to grasp and you need to be able to communicate to your management and the regulator what's in those models and we try to incorporate more actuarial guidance into solutions so that um, these help choosing the right models uh, for the price calculation or expected loss and also help the actuary to ensure the the legal conformity of the tariff so is there an equal treatment of insured persons for example again the regulator will look at this so um but i think the most important aspect here is that we look at, we need to look at the process we need to look at the models the business rules these all need to be orchestrated we need to ensure governance repeatability transparency along all the relevant process steps because also the regulator again will look at these things and we need to help them um really achieving the transparency thank you dr bex uh, before we move to the second part of our uh, uh discussion uh, there's a there's a poll uh, this is my second poll i mean uh, we are doing this to uh, just make it interesting for all of our uh, participants uh, uh, this surprise is always uh, fun and uh, and also uh, we have uh, about 12 questions uh, that uh, that have already come in please keep them flowing in we will uh, address uh, a select few of these at the end of the uh, panel discussion so i'm just launching the poll uh, uh, again uh, about 30 seconds yeah
we have answers coming in even now so i'm sort of okay closing the poll yeah so here are the results uh, so so the question is uh, what are some of your expectations from the technology team uh, with respect to managing data and analysis uh, we asked you to share only uh, two of the uh, four options um, the highest uh, 76% i think uh, um, mentioned uh, unified platform for managing data and analytics uh, again 57% uh, is capability to manage huge amounts of data interesting i mean uh, if there's any anything to sort of uh learn from this is that the the fraternity is uh, extremely open uh, and wants to pick up a lot of the, the these tools i think what mr sharma is doing with the institute right now is is, is very well timed uh, you'll feel you'll find a lot of people interested in participating mr sharma i think uh so so great and uh, moving to the second part of our uh, panel discussion uh, mr malhotra i think uh, the first uh question is for you Uh, so so i mean uh, we've read this right uh, the boon and both the bane of digital transformation is data right i mean do you agree uh, and uh, how are, how are you managing this data deluge uh, what is your expectation from technology thanks rudra y yes i uh, completely agree to it uh, if data is used uh, correctly it is taken correctly it is a boon um, if there are issues and challenges with the data it becomes a bane um so let's start with the data journey um so uh, when we uh, capture the data uh, what historically used to do is uh, we used to think about the processing time um so only a limited set of uh, information used to get captured now as things are evolving uh, we need to uh, bring in more and more fields we need to capture data correctly and accurately we need to bring in processes to ensure that uh, the data we are uh, capturing uh, is correct then uh, when when we move to data storage so traditional method of uh, data storage are there's a server uh, in place in office uh, which use which is used to store data now uh, with the huge amount of data we are talking uh, are we uh, moving into cloud based solutions uh, uh, can we have a flexible structures uh, through which uh, we can store data and then uh, when we use our data for uh, for the uh, processing and uh, modeling purposes uh um, we need to uh, ensure that our models are flexible um they like uh, um even andrea showed that uh, the models uh, need to be updated quickly so we can't say that the models are complex so we would take x number of months to uh, deliver that particular analysis so we need to be quick on on our feet use the best technologies uh, and use the data which is accurate to deliver the best uh, use cases of uh, the of today's data right thanks uh, mr malhotra uh, mr shah so what are your thoughts on using uh, ai ml to pilot pilot new products into the market and uh, test their viability this is something uh, mr jash has already sort of touched upon uh, regulatory sandbox i mean how do you do this uh, while keeping customer experience uh, top of mind what are the things that you would sort of keep on top so so i would uh, kind of uh, and uh, what what we are seeing is right in terms of the fact that uh, new products uh, okay let, let me kind of uh, extend this products is just one element of it but the entire customer journey is extremely essential right uh, so i would really extend the scope uh, from from just the product to include pricing and the customer journey uh, ai ml along with the the uh, uh, the regulatory challenges that we have face sometimes not always Uh, uh, uh can be actually uh, used despite uh, them being there first is in terms of improving the customer journey and customer experience uh, uh which is basically basically looking at how, how the sales is being done what are the processes what is the extent of digitization happening in this how quick and easy we make the the entire process uh, the other element which is which is on the pricing side uh, pricing side itself is is a far more evolving and far more faster evolving in this Uh, uh and already ai ml is doing a wonderful job internationally and to certain extent within the indian context also uh people have started using using uh, uh, gradient boosting random forest much more frequently from their analysis perspective and also uh putting some of these findings into 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 as as back said in terms of an explainable ai uh to the regulator and also putting it and taking it to the 
uh, the final uh, frontiers of, of customer sales or distribution piece. That's that's already happening in some context. And I think that that's going to keep on increasing. The pace is only going to get uh, better and better as we go along with this. Yeah. Thanks, sir. Um, so, Mr. Sharma, uh, with opportunities like uh, wearable and telematics, I mean, we have touched upon that. Do you think insurers uh, will slowly play an uh, active role in uh, risk management for their customers uh, through uh, wellness uh, programs and then merely just providing financial risk cover? Uh, this is also for, uh, for Mr. Malhotra, in fact. Uh, Mr. Sharma, maybe you could. Uh, no, I think uh, this uh, variables telematics are are really very interesting in terms of uh, uh, you know improving the overall wellness of of the customers. And eventually, if you look at uh, you know, for example, in case of uh, health insurance or in case of life insurance, uh, eventually, uh, you know, if you are able to relate uh, the, the 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 wellness with the the price of the product. Uh, it would really, really help uh, overall improvement in the health of the policyholders because they get prompted, uh, you know, by the fact that they might get some discount in the premiums. Um, it's, it's it's not started in India; it's going to take some time. But I think this is something which will really help in terms of, uh, you know, uh, you know, kind of pricing based on the risk. You know, somebody who is very, very high risk, and it's just not the pricing at the beginning. You know, you can just really see depending upon. Uh, how the health or, or how the person is really, uh, you know, taking various measures or the steps, uh, uh, you know, in, in the future of the policy and improving his health can have a bearing on the future premiums. There could be variable premiums. I would say it's too early. I think it is under development uh, in, 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 in India, maybe uh, it could be through sandbox. Uh, and it has taken up very well in some of the other markets. I mean, South Africa is a very, very good classic example of how they have very... Uh, some companies have implemented the wellness program, uh, but I think uh, this is something which would be really interesting uh, when it comes, uh, and will help uh, you know differentiated pricing for the customers depending on how they how they perform in terms of uh, I mean simple things like number of steps taken, uh, right. and dieting etc cetera, etc cetera, would be really interesting. Yeah. So, uh, but one thought sort of comes into my mind in such a case where some customers are, might sort of come and say price discrimination, right? I mean, I uh, might scream that, okay, both of us are so similar, same age, uh, non-smoker, everything. Why are you pricing? It's similar for us. Uh, I think e-commerce also already faces such a problem uh, in some certain markets. Uh, Mr. Malhotra, maybe Mr. Shah, uh, this is relevant, I think, to both of your uh, industries. Mr. Malhotra, do you, how do you see this? Uh, are you already doing something like this? Yeah, yeah. So um, as Sunil said, um, through uh, sandbox exercises, there are products in the market with the which the insurance companies are uh, selling. Um, so, so the use cases of like telematics is not just uh, pricing uh, customer behavior. Telematics device could actually change uh, customers' behavior as well. So, um, the telematics devices are being used in fleet management solutions. So, what I mean by that is, um, you could track uh, where your fleet is, find out best routes for your fleet. You could even see uh, how your driver is uh, performing. Is he feeling fatigue if there are uh, sensors uh, installed in the device? So you could uh, do a whole lot of things uh, with the telematics device. Uh, so it gives you a lot more control over uh, the business. Uh, so it, it's not just uh, we are able to price the risk better. Uh, it's also that uh, we are able, even able to uh, improve the risk. Right. So, Similarly, on uh, wearables, uh, so 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 with wearables, uh, with constant tracking, we are able to send mass messages uh, to the customer to uh, even improve uh, their health. So once uh, they know, they are aware of uh, what's going wrong, uh, they are able to uh, see and I mean proactive customers uh, even go for improvements. Um, with IoT, there could be sensors installed in uh, wearables um, through which. Uh, there could be emergency services, uh, which could be even uh, provided to the customers. So, so yeah, it's not just uh, uh, limited to pricing uh, these technologies. Um, it would uh, be covering whole uh, gamut of services uh, around uh, motor and uh, health uh, industry. I saw Mr. Uh, Shah uh, raise his hand. Uh, Mr. Shah, would you like to add? Uh, to yeah, that? yeah. So, in fact, uh, it is pretty, pretty uh, right what Garo uh, said in terms of its ability to not only price the risk differently, but also manage the risk. But but uh, to add to the fact that uh, the point that you raised in terms of the price discrimination, uh, it, it's kind of an interesting journey if you, if you really look at it, the way GI as an industry developed, and I'm, I'm most specifically talking about GI. 
we started with law of averages where 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 we started putting everyone in the same basket because that's that's where the whole idea of it is but as as the as the science developed as the techniques developed uh, we started discriminating or differentiating good customer versus bad customer and yes it, this this brings in very very interesting question which is which is more on the on the on the on the grounds of uh, uh, ethically are we doing right thing or not uh, so one way is to say that yes uh, we are discriminating the customer and you are actually say, sending some of the segments out of the insurable population uh, on the other end you are saying that i am trying to give the best price to the best person now now that's the dilemma that we as an uh, actually keep on handling at every point of time uh, and we will keep on doing this and i think this this whole piece is going to evolve and only when the overall consensus emerges in terms of how industry needs to really look at this piece uh, it's going to be very very interesting but Globally, uh, all the regulators have started realizing, and they have started accepting, and they have started promoting also that there is some form of price discrimination which is extremely essential, which is risk-responsive price discrimination. So, if the risk varies, yes, we need to discriminate. If risk is same, then we need to mention that they have to be on the same price. Uh, what what regulator don't like is price discrimination uh, based on customer's price sensitivity. So, if if we start discriminating. uh customers on the on the price sensitive you're saying that he's less price sensitive so you can charge more he's more price sensitive so you charge less that's what uh regulator don't really like but the risk based price discrimination i think is something which is fairly well accepted and going forward it's going to keep on happening so for example if a customer lives in a certain region versus a different region of the city a yeah. uh, discriminating basis that is 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 not necessarily okay or or their income which is a very direct sort of uh, absolutely absolutely yes It's very interesting. I think uh, I think we're headed for uh, really uh, you know uh, fun times. If all, if all of our products need to uh, sort of look at so many variables and to price accurately, we might actually have a similar products from different companies priced very differently, uh, and it might sort of work for a niche segment, right? Very interesting. Okay, um, uh, Mr. Jash, uh, the market has been getting dynamic uh, each passing day, and with uh, regulatory changes like the IFRS 17 and risk-based capital. uh which what impact do you see on the actuarial function i think this is a very important uh, sort of regulatory question for the sector yes definitely i think uh, i think it, it is the life of an actuary is going to come more interesting and and one of the things that i definitely foresee uh and basically something that uh, sunil mentioned that actuary is not an actuary it is just an actuary he has to get uh, sort of like get himself into other areas and know that say So I'll take two examples. Like I for seventeen, you need to understand accounting very well. Uh, I think today actuaries in the part of the curriculum do learn about bit of accounting, and as part of the daily work they understand that. But then now now it requires them to have a good understanding of the accounting philosophies and accounting norms because uh, what I for seventeen is likely to do is to break any barrier that is left between finance and actuarial within an insurance right. organization. Uh, Secondly, if you look at the risk uh, pricing or risk-based pricing, or if you look at the dynamic pricing, where you need to integrate more, or you need to understand how underwriters work or how underwriters think. So definitely, you need to be sitting more closer to your underwriters to understand how do you doing it. Uh, in life insurance, it makes a more very important point because today actuaries and underwriters actually sit different places, even in different buildings. So, so that way, uh, uh, a transformation needs to happen, and actuaries have to upskill themselves uh, to sort of know that and be relevant in that thing. Uh, secondly, in terms of uh, technology, I think tech savvy will be the word uh, for future. They have to understand this because if they have to work on data and the so volume, a huge volume as part of data. We have been working on data till now, but then. what is coming along the way particularly with ifrs 17 where we have to maintain sort of like very granular level information uh, you need to be quite tech savvy to know how to manipulate data to get to your desired results so i think this this quite are the places where i see uh, a big transformation coming and i think actually is in terms of the recent curriculum change uh, that is also meant to aid them to get there uh, but actually is have to keep on learning you, you once you once you become a fellow it doesn't make you stop learning you have to keep on learning to remain relevant So, so the uh, the interesting takeaway here is you see a convergence of professions happening. Actually, yes. a finance uh, sort of account role as well as a data analytics role. I mean, sort of when you combine it to one. Yes. Um, 
Yeah, very, very interesting. Uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Dr. Bex, uh, in your markets where RBC, uh, so uh, risk-based capital and IFRS is uh, 17, are working in tandem uh, with the digital transformation of the entire uh, insurance value chain. How do you see insurers already adapting? I think uh, the process may be in a very early stage in India or uh, maybe sort of happening over the next course of one or two years. But you've already seen it happening, right? Yeah, I'm very in line with, with Mr. Jess as well here. So these, these two um, trends like AI, automation, machine learning on the one hand, and the evolving global and local regulatory requirements, they are collective forces that change um, the profession of the actor dramatically. And our market has seen that somehow. So again, I think we are moving to a more strategic task with the actuaries beyond traditional risk management. So they're not part of insight generation and decision-making across core processes, whether pricing or claims or marketing and sales, but also accounting. So a very interesting new role. And I see two points, two major aspects, how insurers are reacting to that. First, they talk more about analytical ecosystems because decisions are at the core of the process. And I think your last poll has just shown that. So besides talking about governance, uh, re the regulator and productivity and transparency, this is also about the removal of brain monopolies. You get them when you hire data science, superheroes um, who work on their own analytical environments. So bringing together and, and joining forces, this is really one important aspect here. Second, I see that um, insurers challenge their actuarial talents by new data-driven roles. So they hire guys, they call them data scouts, who look for new and fresh and interesting data to be incorporated into the decision process, or data scientists. Right. Some insurers embed these functions really within the actual department. Others set up data science teams that cope with new types of analysis, and surely they are competing with actuaries. So whichever way is the right one, I don't know. But we see that there are new ways of collaboration that are explored here. And roles like the actuarial role, which has been relatively stable over a long period of time, is now completely redefined. So my personal view is that, and I see that in many customers, actuaries really have always been the true data scientists of the insurance world as they combine the subject matter expertise with communication skills um, and of course, the, the mathematical and also sometimes technical, uh, the younger ones uh, know the technical perspective as well. So this is also part of the education and the pressure of regulators and the digital transformation, I think will make the role of the actuary even more essential in future. I think, uh, I mean, in India, we might be at a, at a good spot where we can sort of learn from the experiences of the, of the, of the, of the companies in Europe and, and uh, accordingly adapt ourselves, uh, prepare ourselves for, you know, these unforeseen challenges as, uh, as IFRS 17 gets implemented. I have a, so we, this brings us to our uh, third poll uh, of the day. Uh, so I'm just going to put it up uh, again uh, about uh, 30 seconds. Uh, let's see the results. Yeah. Yes. And our panelists can vote as well. I mean, uh, this, this voting is open to both our participants and panelists. We're actually getting a lot of questions. I, I think I have over 20 questions, uh, but we are running very much over time. So I'm just trying to figure out. Um, I think we'll take uh, two to three questions uh, at the end of it. The hard part is selecting which is the right question. Okay, 39 seconds, ending the poll. So the question we asked was, what are the biggest challenges you foresee in IFRS uh, 17 implementation? Uh, select any two. Um, workflows between actuary and finance. Uh, this is something uh, Mr. Jash uh, mentioned. Uh, this is uh, probably the biggest challenge, followed by um, reporting management and data management. Hmm. So, so reporting management is definitely going to be a challenge. I think uh, getting used to a new system, a new style is not going to be easy at the first go. Uh, but I'm sure uh, processes will be built. And maybe I, I, I think, I mean, maybe I'll, I'll leave it open to you. But a year down the line, people will be comfortable with the new system. The initial few months are always challenging, right? My last question, uh, uh, really, 
is is for uh, mr shah uh, and please uh, this is actually a very open question that uh, uh, feel free to add uh, what are the lessons that the actuarial community has taken uh, from the experience of covid and uh, related uh, disruptions as you said this is really an open ended question yes uh, because our learning is not not going to be very very different from most of the other people uh, in last part large large element for say so for example getting adapted to work from home everyone has to do it and that's the learning for everyone be it you be it me be it dr bex or 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 any of our audience as well uh, but more, more specifically on, on the on the actual specific learning i think so uh, the assessment and the risk uh, and and the timing of taking that risk is it actually uh, going to be very very interesting because uh, uh, to, to, to give you an example with the covid coming in definitely Uh, so coming to the specific on the on the uh, the risk side of uh, of learning per se, uh, uh, it's ex- extremely important to be agile in terms of the way you accept the risk as well as uh, uh, timing when you go to the market. For example, some of the companies really entered this COVID influence for early on, uh, made a reasonable profit so they're there in that particular product, and then at uh, the end of the day, they actually went to the market. At the same time, some companies entered much later. Uh, and, and, and of course, we saw some kind of losses as well. And some of the companies really ended up saying that this is completely uh, a risk which we don't know, we don't understand, and so we want to stay away from it. So there are there are three three ways of behaving uh, in such a kind of situation, and all of these three uh, things really bring you into perspective. Uh, and what's what's very very important from this this is that when you go and take some risk, which which is of course at an extent not uh, necessarily well understood. Uh, what you really realize or see is that if you are wrong, if you are wrong by five percent, if you are wrong by ten percent, twenty percent, how much money you are going to lose? Uh, it's something which, which I would say, is all always known and written in almost every uh, book on the risk management. But seeing, experiencing, and believing yourself uh, and going through that whole experience is one which is uh, a very, very uh, a big learning for me. Okay, okay, sir. I'm really sorry. The audio issue was still there, but but I understood. I think most of uh, uh, what you said. I think it, it, there's a slight crackle. Uh, I, I mean, Mr. Malhotra, uh, Mr. Sharma, Mr. Jashi, would you like to add to that? Uh, this the pandemic situation. Mr. Sharma, you touched upon it uh, in your keynote as well. Uh, what has it uh, really taught the actuarial profession in terms of uh, how you go about uh, business? I think it's uh, there's a lot of learning, uh, Rodra, from this. Uh, If I were to say, I don't think any of uh, uh, actuaries of our generation had seen pandemic. I think right. we were just used to really read that in our textbook, uh, something called pandemic. Uh, but I think uh, we have seen this pandemic, and it's something which actually is, uh, you know, and, and that's when uh, I refer to the the quote which was, uh, you know, mentioned by uh, Sanjeev Sanyal uh, in in our actuaries day. I think he said, well. while we we could really look at the past experience and really look at the risks but for how about uncertainty and that's when say for example uh, now in the pandemic the experience was emerging we don't know what will happen the next day how many infections will be reported next day what will be the mortality and the mortality is varying over a period and still uh, i think there's a lot of uncertainty about the mortality while we see that you know the 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 number of cases is, has started declining or the mortality is under control but there is there is still a lot of uncertainties uh, you know i i i remember uh, you know before 911 i don't think we would really uh, uh, you know uh, there was the, the catastrophic cover was not so popular before 911 uh, and we would not really uh, you know insurance companies would not really uh, take the catastrophic cover uh, and i think 911 really gave a lot of lessons to everybody that uh, you know there's some catastrophic events are like that could happen uh, and there was a sudden surge in the demand for the catastrophic cover uh, so i think the lot of learning that we have in terms of uh, uh, from from this pandemic is uh, is that uh, you know you really need to find out tools where you can feed in the experience emerging I- immediately and uh, you know the feedback process should should really be there into you know because the mortality used to be very very stable over a period you know it wouldn't change uh, uh, in in a so fast we used to work on the mortality tables you know right. which may not necessarily be refreshed every every month or every quarter you know we would do experience analysis once in a year or or half a year and the mortality experience would be very very stable but now it's changing rapidly and we don't know 
uh, there's a lot of uncertainty. So a lot of lessons from that. But the one uh, positive thing that I see for the industry, I think the industry has taken this uh, pandemic as an opportunity. Uh, I think uh, to look at it, a lot of work from home has been extremely successful. Uh, and uh, I think the overall beneficiary will be the customer in terms of the overall optimization of the cost. Uh, you know, the, the insurance company's overall expense ratios comes down would really help in terms of, uh, you know, better, uh, better offer from the customer's perspective. So, uh, so I think that that's a big positive that I see from this. Uh, but, but we're still to see, uh, you know, what is, what is going to be there over the next quarter or so. Fantastic. I think that's a very interesting thing that you mentioned. Uh, lowering of costs, obviously, that will improve our insurance uh, penetration in India, which is abysmally low, uh, despite, I mean, so many uh, I mean, government policies trying to push it. Uh, okay, so, uh, Mr. Jashan, uh, would you like to add anything to that? Uh, yes. Uh, just one point that I would like to add here is that, uh, one, yeah, basically, the way we have traditionally always approached the problem that look at the past and see what the future is look like to be. This one definitely told us that past has no relevance uh, for uh, measuring the impact. I think one interesting thought that uh, it's, it's, it's come to me in terms of that how do we assess the long-term impact of, of, of us being in the lockdown or lockdown, out of lockdown, then coming back in lockdown, prolonged period of work from home. What is it doing to our mental health? What is it doing to our physical health? And how the impact of that is going to uh, manifest itself, whether it's in the mortality or morbidity rates. I think that will be an interesting uh, study that we'll have to see how it emerges and how, how the future is going to look like. Today, uh, we may not actually realize, we may see a spike, but then is it going to be a long-term sustained rate or is it going to be a blip and then come back to the long-term average that we have always seen in the past? So that's an interesting uh, uh, thing I'm going to watch out for. And then we'll see that how that impacts future pricing as well. I think that this is a very interesting point. In fact, this, uh, this brings me to a discussion I was having uh, with, with, with my wife a few days back as to how the children in the two to five years age group uh, will really see an impact as they grow up. And uh, what will it mean to their, uh, to their development, to their mental health? Because this is their... They're uh, stuck at, at home in a very crucial phase of their lives when, when social interaction, uh, schooling, uh, physical activity is, is, is very important. Uh, no, no better than me, Rodra. My, I have a four-year son and I can yes. see how much he is upset that he's not able to play always outside like the way or he's not able to go to his friend's house so often or not it's able to go to school. And the, and the worst part is they can't understand uh, why yeah. are they being forced to do it. So, uh, yeah. So, so great. I think this was a great discussion. I will just take three quick questions uh, from our audience. We have uh, over 20. Uh, that means uh, people have really enjoyed our, our, our chat today. Um, I, the first question, um, and, and please, uh, that does not mean that any question is lesser than the other. It's just that I'm having a very hard time to select uh, in 21 questions. Uh, the first question, given uh, Sandbox, uh, and this is from an uh, anonymous attendee, uh, given Sandbox uh, comes with a premium uh, or a number of policy caps, how is it going to provide a statistically significant experience uh, sample set for future modeling? Very, very clear uh, question. Yeah, the, essentially, they're saying the sample size uh, is capped, is limited, will it be statistic, uh, statistically significant to give you the results? I mean, uh, please, uh, Mr. Malhotra, Mr. Shah, Mr. Sharma, uh, who would want to? Sure. If you look at, let, let me just uh, take this, uh, and obviously, uh, Gaurav uh, has got a lot of experience in terms of the implementing sandbox. But I think one is uh, the experience, the other is in terms of the concept. Hmm. Uh, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, how it's uh, is being operationalized, uh, how it is benefiting the customers, are customers really liking it? Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, experience in terms of, even if it's not extremely credible, there'll be some credibility from the experience. It may not be 100% credible, but, uh, you know, by using the, uh, the credibility theory, you could give 25-30% uh, sort of credible experience to that you would be able to uh, kind of justify the regulator saying that, you know, it works, the customers are happy with it, it's it really helping customers to meet their needs, uh, and perhaps uh, some of the other aspects, convenience and, uh, you know, appropriate pricing, etc. So, uh, so I think that that's how, how it will help. 
So the question here is actually, I mean, uh, uh, the way I've understood it is very focused on uh, the, the, the individual is saying that the sample size uh, is very limited. Uh, is it statistically significant for obviously a larger population when you sort of open that product up? Uh, so, I mean, do we really have a solve to that? Uh, do we need to have a larger sam sample size, for example, or, or uh, maybe there is no foolproof solve in that sense? Uh, well, actually, if you look at life insurance, you really need to really keep doing that sandbox for at least few, uh, at least a year or so, and and then observe that over a period, maybe a couple of years, to get experience. So um, I agree with that. I think from life insurance perspective, it may not necessarily be credible, uh, but I think health insurance and some of the other motor insurance coverage are short period for a year, and I think Gaurav probably and Mehul would be able to respond to that. Right. Yeah, so, so I think so I will uh, thanks uh, Sunil for giving me an opportunity. Uh, so yes, uh, this is one of the biggest challenge. Uh, but the way I see this will be the, the, the rational way I graduated really coming with a sandbox on a uh, uh, volume basis is this to first see whether there is a market acceptability of this product. If, if Mr. Malhotra or Mr. Jash wants to add to that, because I have another interesting question right after that. I've been sort of surfing through uh, the questions and I'm picking up the really creative questions. Sure, I'll I'll just uh, quickly add uh, Rudra. So, uh, yes, so, so the idea of sandbox was more to do with testing newer models. Um, there could be some uh, projects under sandbox uh, for which we we could have historically past data, um, but there are a lot of uh, projects uh, for which we have a lot of proxies uh, available. So yes, I completely agree that uh, a sample size of uh, fifty lakhs of premium may not be sufficient. Uh, to uh, price the risk, uh, but uh, I think the activity of Sandbox was more to test uh, newer things and newer strategies and see uh, how they work in the insurance space. Um, so, but from pricing uh, point of view, there are a lot of uh, other uh, data sources that are available. Uh, those would counter uh, with the experience of this limited set of customers uh, to get to a proper uh, pricing. Okay, okay. Um, uh, Mr. Shah, uh, would you want to uh, come back on that? Uh I, I think that Gaurav has answered the question well. Uh, okay. That is what exactly I was saying. Yeah. Okay, sir. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, another question. So, you know, um, wearable devices uh, will be preferred by customers who have a healthy lifestyle, right? Uh, this is a very interesting point. Uh, this might pool only good risk together uh, and bad risk uh, getting very few options or be priced more. So, so how do you see this? Mr. Jash, this is a very, I, I like it. I like it. It's a creative question. It makes one think. Uh, what would you, how would you see? Yeah, this? so, so yeah, that's, that, uh, that's, uh, that, that's where the challenge is in terms of that, how do you cater to the population who's outside? Yes, uh, wearable or, or, for example, the, the vitality or the wellness feature that uh, typically is sold in any international market is typically preferred by people who see a value uh, and who sort of gains by it are the ones who go for it. Uh, the people outside of that uh, who do not, uh, so I'll look at it in this way. Um, yes, there is an ethical element that, that you have to make sure that, the, that there is no, uh, uh, other than risk based discrimination, there is no other discrimination. But having said that, I would see that this is also an incentive for them to move into the pool. I think there are products which doesn't sort of necessarily gives you, but gives you an opportunity to get into wellness at a future date. So, so it could be an incentive to sort of maintain a better health style or improve your health style to do it. In fact, the other way of working is that there are uh, products that are coming that it's been offered specifically targeting people with diabetes. And there, the whole idea is that if you improve your health uh, through a proper management program, your terms can be improved later on. So it's basically it's the other side of the spectrum where there are very, very uh, uh, not so healthy lives who naturally do not get insurance, but then they are getting incentivized by coming into the pool, uh, subject to their uh, signing up for that. Or something, an interesting product that is uh, it was introduced in India, and there are a few other examples in other markets, uh, which is a quick smoking. Today, smokers are charged more than the non-smokers, naturally for a risk, there is a risk discrimination. But there is an interesting feature coming in where if you pledge to uh, quit smoking, and if you prove to the insurance company that we have quit smoking, your premiums can come down and and that that's actually promoting a healthy lifestyle and then effectively getting them into the pool and getting them to a better side of the risk uh, rather than just so i think innovations are happening in this area and as we go along i think we'll see more and more ideas coming in where 
uh, not only the healthy lives, but the ones who are not so healthy lives can also be brought in the pool with the incentive that they can improve themselves and also get uh, benefits out of it. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. Jash. My uh, last question uh, from the from the audience: uh, How uh, maybe uh, Dr. Bex, you could answer it? Uh, how how easy is it to adopt AI ML in uh, regular uh, operations, uh, actuarial and underwriting for smaller companies? So, do you have uh, uh, solutions for smaller companies? Uh, how would you respond to this? And maybe uh, an experience, global experience here. Yeah, so so many smaller companies are also using um, machine learning and AI, especially um, when it's about the communication with the consumer. So in, on all the uh, digital channels they have, of course, um, using chatbot technologies or other ways of next best activity tracing, all this is using data analytics as well. So this is happening. Uh, another trend is uh, what I see is we are working, for example, with the Insure Lab in Germany, which is an insurance innovation hub, uh, and, and these guys think about pooling data so that every insurer who's part of that network can use that data for risk assessment, for fraud scoring, whatever. So collecting data, which nobody has on its own, and then enhancing this data by your personal processes, this is another thing I see. So in the end, it's, it's coming down to an ecosystem discussion, right? So it's not just the insurer, but it's um, the one who can bring in data to the insurer and work with their clients. So this is another play we have. It's not just the data you have, but how can you generate data? How can you work with others' ecosystem talks? That's, that's the interesting part here. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bex. Uh, so uh, I have a lot of questions again, but I, I, we don't really have the time. We are really short of time. Uh, uh, yeah, we are, in fact, uh, 40 minutes over time. So but that means that we had a very uh, insightful discussion. Thank you for all for joining us today, uh, to all our panelists as well as uh, our participants. I want to especially thank our guest speakers for taking the time out on a busy weekday evening and uh, sharing your valuable insights with us. A big shout out to uh, SAS as well for partnering with us for the series. We will be back again soon with the next episode. Um, stay tuned.